If you're like me, sometimes you stumble on a show and you end up liking it so much that when it stops, you're at a bit of a loss of what to do next. I had that experience just recently with a new show called Mythic Quest that's uh, currently streaming on the new Apple TV Plus service. So I just thought, why not share with you guys and let you know a little bit about why I liked it so much. In a world of legendary heroes, one man will rise to take all of the credit. This game has something that no one else will. Me. We go to so this is Mythic Quest. The show is set in the studio where they create this game. That's the game you saw a little bit of. The game itself doesn't play too much into uh, the the TV show. It does, obviously, it's kind of the basis of what's everything that's happening, but it's really a show about what's happening in the studio and particularly the ensemble cast of main characters that, that uh, work there. This is the main guy. This is... Iron Grim, not Ian Grim, Iron Grim. He's uh, the ultimate narcissist, as you can see. What you just saw is exactly what he is. They do delve into his character a bit more towards the end of the season. You get to see a few more layers behind him. But yeah, he's just a really funny, totally arrogant, I mean, exactly what you would imagine of this sort of visionary video game designer. But the good thing is he actually is a visionary. Like he has in this world, he has created something really special that is really popular. So, I mean, I've, some people might find him a bit too much. I really like him, especially uh, the dynamic he has with the uh, other people in the cast. This is where the magic happens. That guy you just saw there was, um, what's his name? Uh, David. He, you know, you start off, you don't really think he's much of a character, but they really get into him throughout the season. And yeah, he actually ends up being really funny, even though he's playing the straight man. Um, I, I, it was a great performance by that actor. And uh, yeah, the, um, the the girl he was with, we'll talk about him a bit, uh, her a bit later. She's also really great. Hey, can I get a coffee? I'm coming. Up. That's her. That's her. Um, her name is Jessie. Uh, uh, Joe. Jessie is the actress. Joe is is the is the character and she's this she's just super crazy she's kind of like she plays this stalker character she's totally obsessed with iron at the start but then you see when um as david she's actually david's assistant but she's totally obsessed with iron she's drawn to men in power and she's just completely crazy and i think she's a, she's a character that you just haven't seen a lot recently in a lot of tv shows uh so she's really refreshing to see i really i really liked her she's a great um yeah great actor great character everybody has that that is poppy poppy is this um she's the sort of the other main character alongside iron and she's the she's the one who it's the, it's their clash of personality that creates a lot of the tension and drives a lot of the plot that happens on the show so she's this She's the head engineer. She actually builds the game. So Iron is the creative visionary and she actually brings his vision to fruition. She's like this highly strung, neurotic, but passionate game designer type. She has a very expressive face. Uh, I don't know if that is something that the actor is doing on purpose or that is just her natural expression, but it works perfectly for the character her face has all kinds of strange ways that it moves and yeah it's um she's a, probably a character that people are either gonna love her or hate her she's gonna i find if sometimes you'll find her annoying sometimes you find her endearing uh but yeah it's mostly about you know the the most of this show is about the conflict between her and iron as they as they try and work on this game a game that they fell in love with because they make an impact those games that little kid there you called is sort of like a uh, PewDiePie ripoff kind of thing. It's called Pootie Shoot. And yeah, he's very annoying at the start, but it kind of the, the joke kind of uh, grows on you. And you'll find yourself saying, I give this two and a half buttholes in your own life. Or somebody's legacy. Well, this is my legacy. Our legacy. Our legacy, whatever. It's not my legacy. This guy here, the tall guy, he's head of monetization. He's like this... Uh, 
sociopathic business uh, is you know totally obsessed with money and down here on the left is the writer he's a I guess you would call him a kind of a washed up retired sci-fi author who's won awards and was big in the 80s but now he purely works as the kind of writing muse for the game. He writes the cutscenes and sort of tries to develop stories for new new elements in the game to go through. The important thing is all of these characters are really unique. They all have very distinct personalities and the way they interact with each other really drives a lot of the comedy and a lot of the drama that goes on in this show. It's really well handled. <laughs> I have a BA in women's studies. What exactly is women's studies? It follows the experiences of women and the contributions they've made to... Inquiry withdrawn. That right there, it just... It's what I love about this show. It's so self-aware. It knows exactly who its audience is. It knows who, what the audience wants out there in the world. It's, you know, it's kind of in the vein of Cobra Kai or Silicon Valley. It, it just knows what it is, what it's about, and who it's talking to, and who's going to enjoy it. Unlike recent shows like Picard and Star Trek Discovery, who've just kind of given in to some sort of ideological theme or drive of why they're making the show, and whatever the audience is interested in or wants, be damned. And that kind of reflects in the end of in the show that you get. So this show is the opposite of that. This show is, it actually, it's, it's quite clever because they, they pay lip service to the kind of, you know, the woke crowd, the crowd who's ticking off boxes when they look at a show. They're like, okay, is there this kind of person in it? Is there that kind of person in it? All those boxes are ticked on a superficial level in this show. You know, you've got gay characters, you've got characters of all different rates and ethnicities and, and all that kind of stuff. But it's, at the same time, it's not going to use them as tokens. It's not going to show, just put out boring stereotypes that you get a lot. These are real people, real characters. Their storylines are being fully um, fleshed out and developed. It's, in many cases, openly mocking people who demand, you know, all these different different identities be represented in the show. It's really clever how it does that. I, really on board with that way of making a TV show. Quick thing, um, I'm worried about the time. Yeah, David, I'm moving as fast as I can. It's not my fault that these watermelons don't explode like real heads. I can get you real heads. Not human. That's commitment. That's a bit of a taste. This is the the kind, is if you like that kind of comedy, that's a bit of a taste of how it runs. That's how it plays. That's, that's a lot of how they... Um, build the comedic element of the show and i find it hilarious i found pretty much every episode uh you know i'm laughing in every episode i'm enjoying every episode so yeah if that's the sort of thing you're interested that's that right there is a bit of a sample of what you're going to get i built your vision it's like you're this brilliant painter and i'm your favorite brush i'm just some tool to create your masterpiece i like that metaphor but it's not quite right is it I are think you seriously you about to noodle on my metaphor right now this dynamic here between these two is kind of the main arc throughout the whole season. It's a very interesting take. Unlike Silicon Valley, who season to season, at the start of the season, they'll be, they'll have a goal with their uh, software that, you know, they'll um, struggle to get made. And then by the end of the season, something will happen and they'll finally get it. This show doesn't really take that tact. It's at the, the season actually starts with the launch of their new Raven's Quest expansion. And that doesn't come into play so much throughout the show. The real arc is character-driven in the show. So it's all about the relationships between the characters, especially between Iron and Poppy, and how that plays out. So that's the kind of show that you're getting into here. It's it's very character-driven. And uh, it's really refreshing and really enjoyable. I know that I can be difficult. Papa, you can't give up. We're like the Beatles. <laughs> Together, we make masterpieces. I could write the lyrics and the music and everything, but it would sound completely different without the drums. Wait, I'm Ringo? Well, yeah, of course you're Ringo. I mean, look, somebody's gotta keep the beat. Oh my God! 
at least you brought me breakfast. Oh, this is mine. It's prescription. A prescription bagel? Legally, you're actually not allowed to ask me about Whatever. it. Whatever. That right there, you've probably noticed over the last, you know, decade or so that many interactions between certain characters, between certain types of characters. Here we've got two women who both work in tech, who are both not white, talking to each other in a way that is not just, oh my God, we love, all women love each other and we're just so amazing and there's no conflict and we're all, we're all here for each other, go girl power. No, this is, that uh, relationship right there is one of the main antagonist relationships in the show. Uh, that Coda and um, Poppy is, the, is her boss. And, you know, it's just so refreshing to see this sort of thing handled well. There's conflict. There's, these two don't like each other. And they, there's even a, um, a scene in the, in the show where a bunch of girls are brought into the studio as part of a women in tech program. And they go to that woman and she's like, you know who your number one enemy is, girls? Other women. Because we're all ruthless against each other. You know, we're working in a male-dominated industry industry, and we're competing against other women. It's just a real refreshingly honest take that you're, you're not going to hear very much anywhere. And I just, this is what I like about these shows that are found on streaming services, as opposed to traditional TV or cable shows or whatever. They seem much more inclined to take these kinds of risks. They just seem to be able to tackle certain issues with a lot more nuance, without being preachy, without making anyone who disagrees feel as though they're being attacked. It's just really clever in that way. And as a person in the audience, it's something that I personally really appreciate. And another another thing that a show like this can do is that you have a lot. They have a lot more freedom in the way they make these shows. There's one episode. It's called Dark Quiet Death, and it's a complete diversion away from the main storyline. It's set in a flashback, and none of the characters from the show are in it. And it's just a kind of, it's really just a love letter to making video games and a a kind of morality tale about what happens when a creative project becomes super popular and is eaten alive by corporate interests and how that you know affects the people who created it in the first place and it's just i thought it was a brilliant episode it really kind of underpinned the heart underneath this show and you know hit all the right emotional spots and it was you know as someone who played video games in the 90s it you know it's just really connected for me and I just don't think that's something that you would have seen on a, you know, on regular television or cable or something like that. So yeah, if you like the look of that, definitely check it out. I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing another season of this and seeing what they do. Very funny, very well made. Go check it out. Mythic Quest, Raven's Banquet.